Welcome to A Healthy Curiosity, the podcast that explores what it takes to be well in a busy world. With self-care strategies from Chinese medicine, functional medicine, Ayurveda, neuroscience, and beyond. I'm your host, Brody Welch, a licensed acupuncturist and transformation catalyst, here to support you on your journey of health, happiness, and personal evolution. Hello, hello, and thank you so much for tuning in today. I hope you are taking such good care of yourself and staying well. From a Chinese medicine perspective, there's a concept of protective qi, which is the energy that helps us fight off invading external pathogens. And I think it's just worth noting in this time of COVID-19 disruption that there is nothing more important to your protective chi than prioritizing your sleep, your nutrition, especially ditching your sugar and dairy and processed food, keeping stress to a minimum, spending time in nature, and practicing qigong, breathing and moving. All of these are great ways of boosting your protective chi, according to Chinese medicine. So I'm really hoping that whatever disruption you may have experienced in this time of physical distancing, where lots of businesses are closed, including my physical acupuncture clinic. So I really get that the disruption is real and the fear and anxiety can be real, but so is the opportunity to change up our daily routines in the direction of better. For example, you're probably already doing things a little differently, like washing your hands for 20 seconds every time you come in the house. And I'd like you to take a moment and consider what in your life has been practically begging you for a shift, maybe for a while now. And then consider how you might alter your home environment or routine to make that shift a little bit more easily actionable more attractive, or to reduce friction between you and the thing that you're wanting to do. For example, I used to go to the yoga studio several days a week, but as that's now closed, I've moved my yoga mat from the trunk of my car to the front closet. Our family has gathered up all the free weights that have been scattered to different rooms of the house, and we now have put them on a repurposed shoe tray in the living room so that any of us can roll out a mat and do a little weights workout anytime. Instead of making multiple trips every week to the co-op to get fresh produce, we've signed up with a local farm that's doing a produce box delivery so we can get our fresh produce without having to leave the house. And something that I'm hoping is going to be a new routine is the other day I hopped on a FaceTime chat with my sister and a friend that we grew up with and my husband from the next room. And we all played a game of virtual cards, like one of those partner games where you bid. We played it through an online app. And with the exception of being able to get up from the table to bring each other tea and chocolate, it was just like sitting around a kitchen table together. It was great. I've also had virtual dinner with my in-laws over Zoom. And these are things that we could have been doing all along, even before this shutdown of society, but we just hadn't. And so it's an opportunity with the new normal, to perhaps inculcate some routines that support what's really important to each of us, whether that's staying connected to our loved ones, our meditation and exercise, our nourishment, our time in nature, etc. So I'd love to hear from you what you're doing differently and what opportunity this disruption is creating for you and establishing your new normal. Feel free to email me at brody at brodywelch.com. And also, while you're there, let me know how I can support you in this time of weirdness. I am considering all kinds of things, but would love to know what would be most useful. I'm here to help. Also, if you are bored and deciding that now is really the perfect time to be learning something new like Qigong or the basics of Chinese medicine, or if you could use some support in a coaching capacity, 
I am here for you. You can visit brodywelch.com, Brody with an IE, Welch with a CH. And now it's my pleasure to present today's interview portion of A Healthy Curiosity with Dr. Terry Walls. Welcome to A Healthy Curiosity. I'm Brody Welch, your host, a holistic health coach and Chinese medicine practitioner. And today we're going to be talking about autoimmunity and how to use diet as a tool to support ourselves with my esteemed guest, Dr. Terry Walls. I had the pleasure of interviewing Dr. Walls a while back, and I am so pleased that she's willing to join me again today with updates on what she's been doing research-wise and about a new book that she has coming out. For those of you who may not have caught that earlier episode, Dr. Terry Walls is a clinical professor at the University of Iowa, where she conducts clinical trials testing the efficacy of therapeutic lifestyle to treat multiple sclerosis-related symptoms. In addition, she's the author of The Walls Protocol, How I Beat Progressive MS Using Paleo Principles and Functional Medicine, and the cookbook, The Walls Protocol, Cooking for Life, The Revolutionary Modern Paleo Plan to Treat All Chronic autoimmune conditions. Dr. Terry Walls, welcome to A Healthy Curiosity. Hey, thank you for having me. It's great to have you back. And I'd love to know what you've been up to since we last talked. And maybe uh, just to bring people into the conversation who aren't already familiar with your story, a quick breakdown of what that what that was and what it is. Oh, sure. So I'm an academic internal medicine physician at the University of Iowa. And for many years, I was at the Iowa City VA very much conventional, latest drugs, newest technology, and very skeptical of complementary alternative medicine. But in 2000, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And I read the science and decided that I, of course, wanted to treat my disease as aggressively as possible. So I did some research on who was doing the clinical research here in the Midwest, Uh, went to the Cleveland Clinic, saw their best people, took the newest drugs, and went relentlessly downhill anyway. Within two years, you know, it was very clear that I was continuing to go down. Now, my Cleveland Clinic physicians told me about the work of Lauren Cordain, and I read his papers and his books and decided after 20 years as a low-fat vegetarian to go back to eating meat. I gave up all grain, all dairy, all legumes, huge change, uh, but continued to go downhill. Uh, The next year, I'm in a tilt reclined wheelchair, and I, I began taking more, even more aggressive drugs, uh, including the new potent biologics. But I continue to relentlessly go downhill. I also have uh, trigeminal neuralgia. Uh, and actually, that had started you know, 20 years earlier. Uh, and so uh, that's getting worse. The MS is getting worse. The disability is getting worse. I go back to reading the basic science. Uh, I'm reading more ancestral health principles. I discovered the Institute for Functional Medicine. I take their course on neuroprotection. I have a longer list of supplements. Uh, You know, and I figure out that the supplements help the fatigue a little bit, but it's certainly not recovering me. But then I have this really brilliant aha moment, like what if I redesign my paleo diet to stress the nutrients uh, from that I was reading from my basic science uh, in functional medicine. And so that's, again, several more months of research. I, and I, I get that new uh, way of eating lined up. Now, for reference where I was at, at this point, I have brain fog, and that's getting to be more troublesome. I have fatigue that is really quite profound. It's difficult to walk 10 feet using two walking sticks. I, my trigeminal neuralgia is more frequent, more severe, and much more difficult to get turned off. It's very clear to me that I am likely soon to become bedridden, demented, and I I was definitely facing the prospect of intractable pain. That's where I was at the end of 2007. I start this new way of a a highly structured paleo diet. I go back to my daily meditation. I've been working very closely with physical therapy, doing that uh, as closely as I can. And that was about 10 minutes uh, that I could do a day. If I did more, I, I couldn't function at work. Uh, I start this new way of eating, uh, and within a month, I can tell that my energy is improving, my um, brain fog is much less, uh, and in two months, it's very clear that my pain is markedly less, and I begin to get stronger. And at the end of three months, I'm walking with a cane throughout the hospital. 
Uh, and at six months, uh, you know, and my physical therapist is, is so impressed that I'm getting stronger. He's got me lifting weights. He's advancing my physical therapy. I'm doing more, much more intensive rehab. Uh, and at six months, I get on my bike and I uh, am able to do a bike around the block the first time in six years. I'm crying. My wife's crying. My kids are crying. And uh, that's really when my understanding of disease and health is transformed and how I practice medicine is transformed. I'm much more focused on diet and lifestyle with uh, the patients I'm seeing in clinic. I, and uh, ultimately, my chief of staff and my chief of medicine at the university uh, direct me to get a case report written up, a case series written up, and then we start the process of creating the first safety and feasibility trial. And of course, that would ultimately launch this, this uh, wholesale shift in the type of research and the type of work that I do. That is, I'm, I'm always amazed at how powerful your story is and it and just how impressive it is to to be able to like take on or to like it just it takes a lot to be able to change what we're doing especially when so much of our de- our identity is wrapped up in it and so that's just a, a remarkable you know, thing that it, it, we all do this in every aspect of our life we cling to um, our current understanding of reality and we ignore fact after fact after fact because we can't give up our current understanding of reality. It takes an enormous amount of stuff to get us to abandon our previous understanding. Right, exactly. We've got that we've got that bias, that cognitive bias towards what we already know and what we already believe and if something really challenges that it can be it can be a lot before we're willing to to try right. something new, which is why I think that especially in a culture that is so science is king that it's it's really important that you are doing the research that you're doing. And so for yeah. for kind of the science minded uh who may be listening out there um and who who might be who might necessarily not necessarily trust something that seems like a fad or like a, a new thing what might you be able to share that would well, help someone feel more comfortable if they are dealing with an autoimmune disease with making a, a paleo change or doing some of the things that you're recommending well you know the first thing i want to do is i, I want to empathize why we don't change mm-hmm. so it took me 27 years of really terrible pain and symptoms for my trigeminal neuralgia before I had enough going on to radically change my diet, my lifestyle, to create the protocol. When I got the MS, in the first three years, I still went down the conventional route because that's what I believe. And then when that failed, and it was clear that my trigeminal neuralgia was failing, and I had two young kids, I thought, God, I got to do everything. And so that's when I go back to reading PubMed And I start reading science, like, okay, what could I do? What's going on in the animal models of MS that I could try? So that's how I started with supplements. And I added those, and they were really helpful for the fatigue. They didn't completely fix it, but any little tiny improvement with MS, you know, is a huge gift. So, and I'm thrilled because I'm reading science, I'm figuring stuff out, and having a positive impact. And, you know, and then ultimately, I, I discover functional medicine, read more science, more theory, more structure, and I create the uh, protocol. But, you know, I am a physician. I do science. So the next step is to do clinical trials. In all of our trials, we're in our fourth one. They've all been remarkably positive, showing safety and showing benefit, quality of life, uh, improved mood, uh, improved motor function. In my clinics... What I do with people is say, run this like an experiment. You know, it, it's, and it's fine to say, look, I'm only going to do randomized, double-blind, controlled trials, which means you're strongly down the drug path. And that's fine. You can make that choice. But the current thinking in the scientific literature for MS is that we are all headed towards more rapid loss of brain volume more rapid and earlier onset of dementia and cognitive decline. And the way to slow that is to turn off disease activity. Uh, and now even my, sci- my PhD, MD, MS scientists, leading scientists are saying, diet quality matters. Stress reduction matters. 
Exercise matters. Not smoking matters. Eating more vegetables. Feeding your microbiome. Getting rid of the sugar. Getting rid of the processed foods. And that sounds a lot like the Walls Protocol. It really does. <laughs> now, now we, we could. It's open to debate. What is the role of drugs? Should you be on drugs or not be on drugs? I do not have that answer because we don't have any scientific studies comparing the two. Well, I'll tell you what my colleagues here at the University of Iowa are doing. When a patient comes in, and more and more patients in this area will come and say, look, I don't want to take the drugs. I want to do the walls thing first. And so our neurologist will say, that's fine. We're, we're all do we're down with that, but you got to do it 110%. So we'll keep following your MRIs. And as long as you are doing great and your MRIs looking good, then it's fine to uh, avoid the drugs. If you start getting more lesions or more relapses, we'll keep trying to convince you to take the drugs. And so that, that's what they're often doing. And rarely do people need drugs. Well, and, and really that's that having that kind of a high bar of like, if you're going to do this, you need to basically you need to be it. part of the proof that this works. And yeah. And, and then the reward for that is, is getting to stay drug free and also <laughs> by the way, not have the disease progress. Uh, it seems, it seems like uh seems pretty potent. And now, <laughs> you know, there's more uh, understanding that, Everyone should be on a therapeutic diet, a stress-reducing program, uh, exercise, and to get off the cigarettes. And then it's a separate decision. Do you take drugs or not? That makes so much sense, even from a preventative standpoint, you know, that, yes. that if we think about kind of like that life with with its stresses and its toxins and, you know, like all the, that we, we always need to be voting for health with our daily actions. It's it's the thing that moves the needle on on how we end up feeling and, and whether or not we're steering in the direction of health or illness. Correct. I'm very careful in my public talks to make clear that I'm promoting health. We're impro improving cellular physiology, protecting the brain against future you know, risk of cognitive decline. Uh, and the decision about do you need drugs today because you're having troubles today, that's a very separate decision. And that, depending on the situation, yes, you might need your prednisone, you might need your disease-modifying drugs, but that are, if you want to do diet and lifestyle alone and have close follow-up, many more specialists are getting much more comfortable with that approach. But, but everyone's understanding there is a huge difference biologically between doing the protocol even at 95% and doing it at 100%. And, and then if, you know, if people are, are still progressing when they say that they're doing the protocol at 100%, the uh, next thing I do is I check for gluten in the urine and in the stool. And often we find that there's gluten in the urine and stool. And so then I get to have a conversation like, okay, it, it's, it's in your diet somewhere. Yeah, right. It's, it's sneaking somewhere. in despite your best efforts, which is hard, right? Like the, we, well, it's, it, it, it's sort of a wake-up call like, Mm -hmm. as to how diligent they have to be. And I help them problem solve where the sources might be. You know, there's a recent paper uh, about the restaurant sources uh, and the grocery store sources and that the gluten-free products are not as gluten-free as, as we think they are. So eating things that are actually, that actually are naturally gluten-free, like vegetables and, and meat, as opposed to yeah. things that say gluten free on the package, yeah. right? Yeah, I couldn't write with you there. I'd love for you to say more about protecting the brain, right? Why does this, why does the, the protocol, what does that have to do with brain protection? Well, there's a lot more recognition that as we age, uh, brain volume shrinks, uh, processing uh, sh uh, slows, recall uh, declines. And there's a lot of variability with that. It would appear, even in healthy adults, that those people who have a nutrient-dense diet, plenty of omega-3, omega-6 fats, and even a moderate amount of cholesterol in their diet, they have much slower brain volume loss. And if you're exercising, much slower brain volume loss. And of course, if you don't smoke, and if your blood sugar is relatively low, then your brain much more protected. In the setting of MS, because that's an inflammatory process in the brain, we know that that accelerates brain volume loss by about a factor of about three. So we, we want to 
create the best environment that we possibly can to turn off that brain inflammation and to make sure the brain cells have all the stuff that they need. Uh, and so, again, there's a big debate about what's the role of drugs in getting the brain inflammation to turn off. But, you know, there's a great paper in Nutrients uh, that I was just reading yesterday that was talking about the role of food sensitivities in incompletely digested food proteins and leaky gut in activating our microglia, activating that brain inflammation, and accelerating this brain volume loss. And my protocol is designed around dealing with the leaky gut and making sure the brain has all of the nutrients it needs to repair. So it, it, it makes sense that clinically, in our, in, our, in our clinics, and in our clinical trials, within three months, people had a noticeable change with reduction in fatigue, improvement in energy, improvement in mental clarity, improvement uh, in thinking abilities. Now, we don't have any direct measures of microglia activity in the humans yet, but we have a freezer full of blood, and so now we're trying to figure out what are the uh, markers that we could go back and look at to uh, measure, do we have any biomarkers that match with that? And one of them is neurofilaments. So I'm writing grants now to go back and do neurofilaments on the stuff we have in the freezer. Cool. I, I I have no idea what that what that means actually, but it sounds it sounds well, promising. It's, cool. <laughs> it's 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 a little uh, molecule that is abnormal when you have neurodegeneration, things like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, okay. uh, multiple sclerosis, and there's many more uh, research that is using neurofilament changes to uh, confirm disease activity or absence of disease of disease activity for MS. Got it. So I'm predicting that as our patients clinically improve, their neurofilaments improve. Uh, And so uh, then that would give us a lovely biomarker that people can use to look at disease activity. I'd love to go to get into a little bit what the protocol is and why it is that way. Like, so you mentioned gluten. Why is gluten in particular such a nemesis? So I I love the paleo diet. Uh, and we're trying to emulate what was available to eat about 20,000 years ago. So mostly it's plants uh, and some animal products. Uh, and it's you know, local, fresh in season, no processed foods, no high glycemic index food, no sugar, uh, no flour-based foods. And when I did my first round of the paleo diet, I continued to decline. So I, I'm, I was way too sick. I couldn't recover with that. It wasn't until I structured it in a much more specific way what my brain needs. So we have this element of what to remove, gluten, that's a protein wheat that can be very inflammatory, casein, which uh, has a, creates some molecular mimicry with proteins in the brain, and eggs, which can be another inflammatory uh, protein. So we, we take those foods out, and then we ramp up foods that are particularly useful for the brain, uh, green leafies, cabbage, onion, mushroom family, and deeply pigmented. Uh, Then uh, we have protein either for the vegetarians or protein for the meat eaters. Uh, And then we talk about fats, particularly omega-3, so omega-6. And we do have a moderate amount of cholesterol because you need cholesterol for uh, cell membranes uh, and for vitamin D and for testosterone, estrogen which are really vital uh, for brain health as well. Yes. I, so, and, or what do people do for protein on the Wells Protocol? So if you're a meat eater, you eat meat. You eat meat, poultry, fish. Uh, and we, we talk about doing this according to what you can financially afford. So if you can afford organic, fine, get organic, grass-fed, grass-finished. And when I took care of people in the VA, they were living on food stamps, on disability income, you know, in rural Iowa with small rural grocery stores. So, in fact, you know, they're just doing the best they can with conventionally grown uh, vegetables and conventionally grown meat. And what we were doing for them was teaching them how to cook. And they still got great results as well. But over time, they, you know, they're very resourceful and creative, and they were often able to prioritize what foods to get organically, and how to get them organically in their neighborhood. 
This episode is brought to you by my Healthy Habits course, Level Up Your Life. Since autopilot dictates about 40% of what happens to us every day, wouldn't it be great if those autopilot routines were the ones we needed to thrive? They could be. Doing this work of habit change with a supportive coach and a network of allies allowed the foundation of my daily habits to automate. I'm now free to move through the world with greater ease and to focus my energy on what matters most. You don't have to default to stress, overwhelm, and numbing out. Step by step, you can lay the foundation for abundant energy, resilience, confidence, and trust in your body. If it's time for you to start a new groove, whether it's meditation or exercise, getting more sleep, or speaking more kindly to yourself, I'd love for you to consider Level Up Your Life. It's so hard to change habits on your own and so much easier when you have a group of like-minded peers all working towards similar goals. We get rolling for the next round in January, 2020. So now is the time to apply. The first five people to enroll are gonna get a super sweet early bird discount. So today would be an excellent day to head to brodywelch.com and apply. What's the issue with a whole grain? Like I could see why a processed food, like gluten that's in yeah. everything, but, but really, you know, like is, is rice a terrible thing? Like that's, you know, kind of one, something that humans have been eating for a long time, right? Not, well, well, let's, let's talk about that. Yeah. So if, if we go back in uh, the timeline of life, mammals began around 200 million years ago. Primates, humans separated from primates around 6 million years ago. So at that point, we're eating lots of greens, small amount of meat. We're eating steadily more meat. Our, our species uh, genus uh, is identified at two and a half million years ago. We're eating definitely a lot more meat, more shellfish. No grain yet. Our species identifies at 250,000 years ago. More meat, more vegetables, bigger brains. 100,000 years ago, we begin cooking our food. Now, the length of our colon shortens somewhat. And we're eating more meat uh, and, and uh, fewer vegetables. Uh, we're also beginning to ferment food, by the way, at 100,000 years ago. At 10,000 years ago, we begin having, uh, uh, we farm, the amount of plants uh, and animal diversity in our diet shrinks. So we're eating less protein. We're beginning to eat more grains, uh, we begin to have legumes. And in Europe, we begin, uh, 8,000 years ago, we begin having dairy. 300 years ago, we begin having white flour and sugar. 75 years ago, we begin having trans fat. 25 years ago, we have, in addition to trans fats, uh, we also have a lot of food additives and stabilizers to make for shelf stability uh, of our food. And, And then 25 years ago, we have a lot more flavor enhancers added to our food. The tobacco industry begins exiting tobacco, moving into the processed food industry, and begins using food scientists to create food products that are more and more addictive. Fascinating evolution. So our microbes radically changed from what we were had in our gut when we evolved. A separate from primates became the genus Homo and then our species Homo sapiens. And our genes have had a short time to be uh, exposed to whole grains, a much shorter time to whole sugar in all these processed foods. And if you look at the uh, course of history for humans, uh, certainly there's evidence that our health has declined. Now, it's true. Certainly, there are societies that with whole grains do fine, and there are some individuals with whole grains do fine. And depending on your genetics, you might not have a reaction to gluten. But we do have evidence that if you eat gluten, that opens up the intestinal permeability and lets more bacterial fragments into your bloodstream, more LPS into your bloodstream, and activates the innate immune system. So that just makes more inflammation molecules in your bloodstream, which then, by the way, will get up to your blood-brain barrier and begin to make the blood-brain barrier leaky. And then these inflammation molecules get into the brain. And now the microglia, which are the immune cells in the brain, become more reactive. And when that happens, that accelerates brain volume loss. 
that makes a lot of sense. And, and so, so genetically who, who are those lucky people? <laughs> we don't have to worry about this. It's all means to step back. Everyone gets a leaky gut in response to gluten. Some people have a much more severe response in addition to the leaky gut to gluten as well. And will have a much higher risk of uh, an, uh, developing an autoimmune disease. So, so if you leaky deep- gut, yeah. That, so they're just to, to to visualize this again. Everything in the gut is supposed to stay in the gut, right? It's supposed to just yes. be this tube that is really the outside world that happens to be running on the inside of the body. And when we eat gluten, we're we're loosening up, uh, we're, we're creating space in the in the walls of our gut so that what's in there can can get out into the body, causing have, causing the immune system to sound the alarm and to say like we've got a problem here. That's going up those inflammatory molecules are affecting our brain as well and crossing the blood brain barrier. And so like leaky gut equals leaky brain. Correct. And if you have a DQ2, DQ8, your abnormal response to gluten, uh, you're much more likely to have a severe abnormal response. So if you get the leaky gut, your immune cells get triggered and you're likely to go down the path of an autoimmune disease process or several depending on other genetics that you have and other microbiomes issues that you have. Everyone, even if we don't have a DQ2, DQ8, you don't want to have bacterial fragments getting into your bloodstream. That, that's still not yeah, a good Yeah, thing. still seems like a bad idea. <laughs> it, it's still a bad idea. It, it's not quite as devastating if you don't have DQ2, DQ8. And it is possible that you're, you're otherwise healthy enough that you tolerate this uh, so it's not devastating. You know, in my clinics, I advise uh, everyone who has a health issue is to just take it out for a month, ideally three months, but at least one month, and then put it back in. And when you put it back in, you'll figure out like, no, I don't feel as good now. Or I couldn't tell the difference, so I might as well eat gluten. And and this is where that 100% is really important, right? Because the immune system is is thinking about or going after things yeah. at the level of a molecule. And so it doesn't matter if you're just having a bite here or there, it's still molecules that are... that. Correct. And it really takes about 100 days to get all of the reaction fully uh, tamped down. Interesting. So if you have it like once a week, you just totally screwed your experiment. If you have it once a month, you still screwed your experiment. You want your experiment to be a high quality so you actually have an answer at the end. I love, love, love that. That is that in in my coaching groups, there is there really is no one size fits all to 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 like the healthy habits and making them work. It's all about the willingness to run experiments on your own life and to see what works and what doesn't. And so this idea of you designing your own, how do I feel the best in my body experiment with gluten? You're saying it's a three month process of being 100 percent on, and I, that, I think that's just really a great benchmark for people to to think about, like whether or not you you are on that autoimmune spectrum somewhere, or or whether or not you think that you're healthy. It's uh, it still could be an interesting thing to run to see if your brain function is clearer, to see if you have more energy, to see, you know, because certainly a low grade inflammatory process that's not even apparent to you is going to be a drag on your overall resources. And sometimes you have to take it out. And if you're like, oh, I don't think it really did that much, then you put it back in and you're surprised that now you have headaches, exactly. you're congested, your breathing's not as good, or your skin is a problem. Uh, so it's the reintroduction phase that can be so illuminating. We also spend a lot of time talking to people about plan when your experiment's going to be. Mm-hmm. For most people, you don't want to start right now. You don't want to start just before a major holiday or a major life event that you're celebrating, you want to pick the time, when's the start date, get your environment as supportive as possible, surround the people around you. It's like, okay, this is the experiment I'm doing, help me out. Uh, and it starts here and goes here, and these are the constraints. So you can plan for success. So, you, you know, when I do my experiments, I you know it, it's a lot of work to get everything lined up and planned and ready to run the experiment. Exactly. And and setting your environment, we are creatures of habit and the easier something is, the more likely it is to happen. And so like if you're if you're 
if you're going to expend the effort to change a habit, you want to set yourself up for success. And so that involves making it easy, making it obvious, making it, it the making the, the new thing, the easy thing. And, and often we take the small steps in the right direction model. And it sounds like with this, it really has to be like that bright line of like, okay, <laughs> I'm doing yeah. this for real. I'm doing it 110% starting now. And, and what you want to do is then re- make it harder to slip up. Exactly. So the things that are tempting, you get out of your eating environment. And you don't go into eating environments that you can't control. Yeah, great idea. I have a lot of people that I work with who like, already believe that maybe having a health coach or seeing an acupuncturist or taking care of themselves is somehow this luxury that they're already doing. And so when I talk to them about making big changes in their diet, their first thought is, well, I'm cooking for my husband or I'm cooking for my kids or I'm cooking for my wife or, you know, whoever. And like, how do I get them on board? And I'm wondering if you have any advice out there for people who, who are like, it's already, it already feels hard. They don't want to be an imposition. They don't want to be the squeaky wheel. Man, that that is hard. What we've done in our clinic and our clinical trials is we bring the, the family, the significant other to the appointments uh, so they can understand uh, the science, uh, what we're recommending and why. Uh, And we talk about food as an addiction and that if I was trying to get someone off of uh, cocaine or alcohol, I can't have them live in the crack house. I can't have them going to the bar. And they may eventually be able to go be around others with alcohol, but certainly not initially. Uh, And so, uh, we have that conversation. Say, okay, now for the experiment to figure out if this is what will help your loved one, we need 100 days, agree on when the start and the stop time is, and how you're going to create an eating environment around uh, my patient, your, your loved one, that the easy thing for them to do is to eat the right stuff. And it's a, really a lot of work for them to screw up and eat the wrong stuff. And how can you make that possible? So we, and we talk about how to have swap outs for family favorites, like how to make a pizza, if that's a family favorite, uh, out of allowable ingredients. And we acknowledge that, yes, it's going to taste different. But if you tell us what the, what the uh, family favorites are, our dietitian can help you identify recipes and products that would be swap outs. And you and your family can talk about what support is. You know, so, so I mean, some of the families, you know, they tell their teens, like, okay, when you're away from the house, you eat what you want. But if the food's coming into the house, it's allowable food or it's going in the trash. Yeah, I think that's, it's really, it's really smart to recognize that, like, we're all in this together. We all want to support each other. And here's what support looks like when we're home. Correct. You know, it, it, and we, we acknowledge that it's very hard to do stuff for, future benefit for all of us uh, in that it is uh, hard to give up future pleasure or, you know, today's pleasure because you want to avoid mom or dad or husband or wife in a wheelchair. That is hard. And you have to acknowledge that. We want to acknowledge that withdrawal is, is difficult for, and everyone's going to be experiencing it if, if they all give it up. So if they all get to eat their, their junk away from mom or dad, that, that makes it a little bit easier. Mm-hmm. But mom's going through withdrawal, so she's going to be cranky. Uh, yeah, it'll be a little difficult at first. I'd love to know a bit more about it, just who your who your protocol is for people who are living. Uh, <laughs> I mean, and people uh, with a pulse. The, yeah, that's the first uh-huh. criteria. Yeah, um, the clinic published research is for multiple sclerosis patients. My clinical experience is that we have great results with other autoimmune diseases, things like psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, systemic lupus, fibromyalgia, traumatic brain injury, uh, some neurodegenerative things, Parkinson's, uh, brain fog, uh, anxiety, depression. Uh, We've also had great results with obesity. Uh, We've had some uh, great results uh, for men with erectile dysfunction. Uh, women with severe menstrual uh, uh, pain, polycystic ovarian disease, fertility issues, 
uh, declining libido. Because it, it, and this is like, this sounds, you know, my, my colleagues kept saying, Terry, you can't use the same protocol for every disease. And my response is, we all have cells. We yeah, exactly. Have, right. There, there, there absolutely are. And, and we know that there's a set of core habits that we all need to have on board to be healthy, no matter what condition we're concerned about, or no matter what our, the genetics of our, of our ancestors might be setting us up for. And it's that, that like you said, you know, we, we need to avoid some of the bad stuff like cigarettes that are obviously toxic. We need to avoid stress. Uh, we, and, and we need to be nourishing ourselves in ways that our bodies can digest and process. So, so yeah, I would yeah. be very much in that camp. When, when the VA I was impressed with my success in the primary care clinic and the traumatic brain injury clinic, they asked me if I would create a clinic designed specifically for, um, for me. Uh, and uh, so we created this therapeutic lifestyle clinic. I went to the pain clinic and primary care clinic and said, give me your most difficult patients whom you're not able to help, but you need to tell them they're not getting drugs from me. They're only getting diet and lifestyle. And so uh, we ultimately were very, very successful. Uh, and that's why I gave you that long list of, the, of diseases that we helped. Now, the symptoms that brought people to me were typically pain and fatigue from a wide variety of disease states. And we, you know, we did our functional medicine assessment. We uh, tweaked which diet plan I was putting them on. Uh, but it was a very similar approach for all of these disease states. And then I saw them every month in a group class. And it is very consistent that people were reporting less fatigue, less pain, more energy, uh, and uh, weight loss without hunger across all those disease states. And, and who doesn't want more energy and less pain <laughs> and, and a healthy weight? I mean, it's like that's, Correct. that's pretty and, much everybody. And, and who doesn't want to have, you know, the, the young men, uh, erectile dysfunction, very common in the, in the population I was serving. You know, after about three months, they're coming back with a big smile saying, Doc, Doc, he's working again. Like, oh, my God, <laughs> you, you didn't tell me my love life would get better. And then th the ladies are telling me that their pelvic pain is less. Their polycystic ovarian disease is less of a problem. They're, uh, and they're getting pregnant. Do you have a hypothesis as to why that would be true? Well, for the uh, pregnancies... Endometriosis, I think, is an autoimmune process. Mm -hmm. For the polycystic ovarian disease, now there may be some autoimmune component, but this might have more to do with improving insulin sensitivity and improving the uh, metabolism of the estrogen and testosterone and progesterone and improving the detoxification of the uh, synthetic estrogens that were stored in the fat. That definitely makes sense. We've been talking a lot on this show with various experts about the microbiome and how it relates to things like depression and anxiety and hormones and sleep. And I'm just yeah. curious about the impact of your program on the microbiome. Well, we will soon be able to say uh, quite precisely uh, in my current study, uh, comparing the Swank diet to the Walls diet, uh, we have a microbiome component. Uh, and so we will be analyzing the microbiome specimens at four points in the study. So uh, it'll probably be another year, maybe a year and a half before I can, we'll have that analyzed and published, but we'll know that. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we've radically changed our foodstuffs uh, over the millions of years that, that we've separated from the primates and the hundreds of thousands of years that we have our own, been our own species. And when you radically change the diet, you starve out the microbes that we'd lived with and uh, fertilize new and different microbes. And this is huge. And, and the reason this is huge is that if you look at your ancestral mother, my ancestral mother, thousands of generations ago, uh, we always have these spontaneous mutations that occur. And if the mutation for an enzyme no longer works and you're less efficient at reproductive success, that enzyme that descendant's gone, that, that gene disappears. However, so let's say we can't make compound XYZ anymore. And if you have, if that's important for, to reproductive success and you can't make it, that gene's gonna disappear and that offspring won't survive, won't have any descendants. But if it turns out, if 
the microbes could make that enzyme and it got into your bloodstream as a byproduct of their metabolic activity, then you had reproductive success. And at that moment, the, the genes for that process had gotten moved from your ancestral mama into your ancestral mama's microbiome. And that's why a really diverse microbiome is so helpful because it makes sure we have the processes we need. And when we're starving out our microbiome, we might be starving out some of those processes that were really important to reproductive success. So Dr. Walls, for people who may have already read your, your book or who are just curious about why what's new in the new book, could you give us a little preview? Oh, yeah. So a lot more detail on the diet. And we'll talk about histamines, we'll talk about oxalates, we'll talk about who needs to be on the low lectin version or the elimination diet. So we can really personalize the level according to your uh, symptoms uh, and issues. Then uh, in the ketogenic portion, I will talk about the type of monitoring that needs to happen, whether or not it's a coconut milk based ketogenic diet or an olive oil based. Uh, then we'll uh, discuss all the great research on fasting, time-restricted feeding, intermittent fasting, periodic fasting, the fasting mimicking diet, stem cells. Who should get stem cells? Who, who do we agree now would benefit from stem cells? What are the kinds of stem cells uh, that you can get uh, here in the U.S. and internationally? And then a much more robust conversation about neural rehab and the use of electrical stimulation. Um, and how you can more thoroughly rehab. Because uh, unfortunately, too many folks are being told with MS, it's progressive, we, you can't recover. And we're explaining why rehab is still possible and how to uh, find that. Uh, and behavior change. The reason people fail uh, has much more to do with being able to successfully extinguish old behaviors and uh, fertilize and amplify desirable new behaviors. And so we'll discuss the science behind how to be more successful in both areas uh, and how to be more successful with getting family members on board. So that's uh, quite exciting. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, metabolic resilience, uh, emotional resilience, uh, cryotherapy. Uh, it is a third new material. And, and then finally, the, the amazing progress we've had in our own research lab and the recognition that we're getting now internationally for the work that we are doing and the importance of everyone should be on a therapeutic diet and lifestyle as soon as you're diagnosed with a serious autoimmune condition. The decision to take drugs or not take drugs is a separate decision that you can make clinically. Everyone needs diet and lifestyle. And you can do that with your primary care doc. Because your specialist isn't going to know anything about that. That's uh, the sad reality, but that's the reality. But your primary care doc can work with you, and, and we teach you how to do that. I love, love, love that. And so it sounds like there's there's a ton of new information from fasting to modifications to stem cells to behavior change, all of which I'm certainly interested in. It really, there's so there's a huge difference between knowing what we need to do to take care of ourselves and actually being able to do it, which is why it's really helpful to have help. Um, and this is, as always, an invitation to people who are listening to this show. I am available to help you. I have a course, um, courses that bring people together, as well as working one on one with people on actually doing the things that you know you need to do to be on your own side and to be to be proactive and and to prevent. Uh, decline in health, whether you have a diagnosis or not. Also, just uh, the, the the whole idea of uh, of fasting and and uh, time restricted eating and things like that. Things that Ayurveda and Chinese medicine have long known. And so, uh, yeah, yes, I'll be interested in seeing the um, the parallels there. It's always always exciting to see when paradigms collide and reinforce one another. Dr. Terry Walls, the book is coming out when exactly? March 17th. March 17th. Okay, great. And so people can be looking for it. And I really appreciate your time today and letting us know what's been what's been going on in your research. And it's just such tremendous work that will benefit all of us. 
Uh, that is excellent. I, I'm assuming you have all of our links. I do indeed. They'll all be in the show notes at brodywelch.com on the podcast page. Great. Thank you so much, Brody. Thanks for listening today. To check out the show notes, get on my email list, or drop me a line, head to brodywelch.com. That's Brody with an IE and Welch with a CH. I'd love to hear from you. If you learned something new or feel inspired to try something different in your life, I'd love for you to pay it forward by sharing this episode with a friend you think could also benefit and give them a reason to listen. You'll be helping to create a world where we encourage each other to embody self-respect. Till next time, be good to yourself.